Welcome back to the Mediocre spider Mat, the show that strives to excite and inspire all you Bully Maguires. Last time, we touched upon various cancelled spider ventures, including one based on Sam Raimi's unmade fourth movie, which in turn reminded me of the wall crawler's more humble video game days, namely 2002's Spider-Man for all major sixth-generation systems. Be Spider-Man. Play the game. It was a weird time for superheroes, as it was an absolute crapshoot whether you were going to get something like, oh, I don't know, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, or Incredible Hulk The Pantheon Saga. And while the old webhead had certainly had his fair share of stinkers, by the dawn of the new millennium, the old Parker luck was starting to turn around. Activision had already published two very successful 3D Spider games, which originally debuted on the Sony PlayStation pretty much back to back. So the desire was already there to continue that same success, and that's exactly when the license for the upcoming movie fell right into Activision's fetid, greasy lap. But who would take on such an endeavor? Neversoft, the original developers of the first 3D game, were going to be way too busy making Tony Hawk for the next 15 years, while Vicarious Visions were already slaving away on a mountain of other licensed titles. So it fell to a studio by the name of Treyarch, you may have heard of them, who are best known for developing my precious, my beloved, Die by the Sword. I miss you, baby. Now, while Treyarch didn't have a ton of overall game development experience under their belts, what experience they did have was invaluable. Real ones out there might recall that it was them who ported and improved upon Neversoft's work in the Dreamcast version of Spider-Man, and they definitely took what they had learned there and reapplied it to the Tobyverse. They were given roughly 18 months a working version of the movie script and not a very big budget, at least relative to what Spider-Man games eventually would receive to get her done. To make that deadline, Treyarch reused a lot of the same tricks Neversoft had come up with, swinging on clouds from rooftop to rooftop, a ton of levels that take place indoors, upside down crawling segments through vents, all the way down to the control scheme and special web moves. That is, however, just how it goes in the licensed game world. If you can take advantage of something, then do. In nailing down the visual style, however, things were made even trickier by the team never getting to see any finished visuals from the movie until its premiere, which meant they had to interpret certain scenes and set pieces on their own, as well as cram in a sinister six worth of extra villains on top. Apparently, Scorpion was originally going to be more of a secondary villain in this, right behind the goblin, and would have had more storyline and levels planned around him. These, as it turns out, were almost all eventually cut for time, although Treyarch would go back and reuse that remaining material for Spider-Man 3, funnily enough. Also, one final fun fact before we move on, up until the 11th hour, both Josh Keaton of Young Ocelot and, uh, eventual Spider-Man fame, played Peter Parker, while Norman Osborn's role went to Q himself, John Delancey. The team just assumed they weren't going to get access to the film's actors, which was fair, considering that level of participation was a very new and very rare thing. But then, suddenly, both Toby and Willem decided to sign on. Cherok felt terrible about this in a way because Josh Keaton had apparently done a spectacular, if not amazing job, and thus they still wanted him in the game. In a neat bit of role reversal, he was then cast as Harry, as James Franco hadn't signed on, which is a big upgrade if you ask me. How many people will die because you let me live? Now, while that's the Cliff Notes version of the game's history, how does it hold up today? Does it arrive like a streak of light just in time? Or does Treyarch's first full go with the character need to be taken back to formula? Well, true believers, you best slip on your masks and take out your web shooters, or not in this case, and let's find out here on my Mediocre Spider Show. 
Let's start with the story. Try to be shocked, but it mostly sticks with what was seen on the silver screen. Some turbo nerd named Peter Parker gets nibbled on by a genetically modified spider, gets swole, does a weird wall run thing, jobs out bone saw, watches Aunt Ben get gunned down, brap, brap, and then has to avenge said murder. This is exactly where level one starts out, in your wrestling jammies and tasked with trying to track down the apparent gang the shooter is a member of, the imaginatively titled Skull Gang. In between this main storyline, additional villains pop up as you'd expect, but it's funny, so many other later Spider-Man movie adaptations adhered to this formula, so it's a trip to see where the trend started. Now, aside from an unlockable and two specific sections later on in the game, which whoo -hoo, we'll get into, there's no real big surprises here, and that of course includes Toby's always scintillating Churchillian delivery. That was just plain rude. We aren't done here, Scorpion. Let's next swing into all the general positives I took from re-experiencing this one. Honestly, I'm kind of taken aback by how good it looks, even in 2022. Since Treyarch could dedicate time to each and every level, building, and skybox, graphically it winds up looking better than Spider-Man 2, or hell, in some cases Spider-Man 3. Obviously, back then you needed to trade in graphical fidelity for the benefit of having an open world, so there's always pluses and minuses. But if you prefer your superhero games level-based, this is one of the better looking ones of its era. Tangentially related to the additional time afforded to Treyarch to craft individual levels is the variety of counters you get with each villain, such as chasing Shocker. Shocker! Y yes, yeah, okay, thank you. Chasing Shocker through a building, then into the subway system, which leads to a tense sequence where the old Shockster can one-hit you, and then finally, a drag-out brawl. You are then subjected to a trap-filled climb through Vulture's Tower, culminating in a pretty thrilling aerial battle high above the city. There's just more theming to these multi-part encounters than what was seen in the boss battles of much later Spider-Man games, where they just kind of lock you into a circular arena where you and the villain just pound away on each other. Hey, phrasing! Now, while I got you here, allow me a moment to give out about the state of the games industry today. Does anyone remember cheat codes? Yes, they were once a thing, and during the sixth generation of consoles, they might have been at their absolute zenith, with Spider-Man being a great example. Treyarch stuffed this bitch to the gills with dozens of cheats and extras, allowing you to swap out Spidey's model for pretty much every other one in the game. You could also enable first-person mode, big heads, tiny Spidey, unlimited webbing like it should have been by default, slow-mo matrix mode, just a ton of goofy stuff. And these weren't hard to remember nuclear launch codes that you had to input on the title screen. No, the game had an official cheat screen where you just had to type in various phrases to unlock said cheat. I miss shit like this dearly, and as more and more Spidey titles were released alongside the rise of achievements and trophies, fun stuff like this just regressed into non-existence. I would then be remiss to not mention the unlockable costumes. There's Alex Ross's original concept for the movie suit, which also swaps out the final goblin duds with his version, along with Peter's bumping pants and even him in his civvies, which I don't think is a great option if you're trying to do the whole secret identity thing. It's a small number of suits for sure, but it's more costumes than what Spider-Man 2 offered, which was a uh, zero. This then leads us to one last feature I'd like to, nay, I need to talk about. Goblin mode. No, not that goblin mode. Treyarch had to fight to add in the ability to play as Harry Osborn in his own mini campaign because, as the story goes, one of their employees had taken upon themselves to rejigger the game's core mechanics to support the Goblin Glider, complete with its own set of unique attacks, which impressed the rest of the team so much they decided to include it as an unlockable when you finish Peter's story on the hardest setting. Now, I said Treyarch had to fight to keep this in the game, which, of course, was due to the meddling of Activision. Wait, what? No? No, it, was, it wasn't! That's 
weird. It was actually Sam Raimi who was initially against it. He felt that controlling a homicidal villain might not have been the best look, so instead he asked if something could be done to change the context so it wouldn't be so overtly nefarious. This request came at the very tail end of the development, so the team either had to put together some hastily made story reasoning or cut the feature altogether. Cooler heads fortunately prevailed. Josh Keaton recorded additional dialogue at the start of each level, with the story being a sequel of sorts where he tries to solve Norman's murder upon finding an extra goblin suit and glider. While the cutscenes that preceded each level of the main campaign, which always featured Spidey, were taken out, it still tasked you with battling through the same levels, but this time with pumpkin bombs, machine guns, and missiles. It's a bit of a bummer though that the game doesn't wrap up up all that well, as Harry still needs to beat his own father to end the game. Now, they did record a few additional lines attempting to imply this is actually an unnamed mercenary that Norman had hired Hobgoblin maybe, but it's never really clarified. Once you beat his ass, it just hard cuts to credits with no additional scenes. So while the feature could have used just a bit more TLC, it's still an incredible extra that was included literally at the 11th hour and something that stands out among Spidey's gaming history. And aside from that, there's not too much else to say about Spider-Man 2002. It's a decent package overall, it plays alright, the camera's a little wonky, but it does feel like it's missing something, it lacks its own specific identity. It obviously does not have the open world web swinging of Spider-Man 2, but it also doesn't have the humor and cameos to geek out over from Neversoft's original. Which unfortunately leads us to... Are a few issues here I just can't ignore, with the first being the controls. Now bear with me here because this is a tough one to explain. Maneuvering Peter Man is super squirrely because you'll be running in one direction then decide to turn the camera and move in another, but he doesn't immediately turn right away and instead just keeps running in that original direction for another second or two. I tried emulating the Xbox and GameCube versions as well as playing the hard copy of the Xbox that I own where this footage is from, but it's always there. Fortunately, since the majority of the game is played indoors or while you're web swinging, it's not a giant issue, but it did annoy me consistently throughout my playthrough. I missed the part where that's my problem. Now, the second negative I encountered is even more nuanced and subjective. The, oh wait, no, it isn't. Fuck the bomb mission! The Emerald Elf has placed a complex web of explosives on a bunch of nondescript buildings. You have a limited amount of time to swing to each bomb location, dodge searchlights which launch gunfire at you if you're seen, avoid an army of robots, and then slowly disarm each bomb. If you're too slow, they blow the fuck up and you die. If you try moving your ass and ignore the robots, you die even faster. With each and every wave of bombs you defuse, more get added in the next. I tried this level over a dozen goddamn times, I don't know, with each one producing a different death at a completely different point in the level, so the randomness here is insane. Hell, Marvel should introduce a new villain called the Random Number Generator, cause ain't no one be fucking with him. Numbers, numbers, numbers! Worst of all, this level didn't even need to exist as it resembles nothing from the movie, so it's just something some madman at Treyarch added in to troll us. Fortunately, that's it for the major complaints and there's not that much else to give out about. I will say that the final confrontation with Goblin is a bit of a letdown. You basically just beat him into submission on the Queensboro Bridge and that's it. You don't ever fly over to the crumbling building on Roosevelt Island and have that cool knockdown fight to the death with Norman, which is a shame because that scene always stood out to me when I was a little baby spider mat. I guess it was just another missed opportunity caused by Treyarch not being given access to footage or dailies from the production. All in all though, there's no super crippling issues that make the entire experience unplayable, except the bomb mission. I don't know who designed that, but I hope they grow extra arms and become a drooling man spider. Or forced to watch Morbius. 
let's talk about the various versions of the game because there's some interesting stuff here. Despite Spider-Man coming to us from Sony Pictures, Activision had brokered a deal with Microsoft to give the Xbox an edge on both the PS2 and the GameCube, although I'm pretty sure they actually didn't care about the GameCube. This mandate was then passed down to the team to create a unique extra level exclusively for the Xbox, which turned out to be a sequence where Norman hires Kraven the Hunter to take out that pesky human spider. This is kind of funny in a roundabout way, as it's now Sony Pictures who are currently in the midst of ruining that character for everyone in 2023. Future people, let me know how that turned out in the comments. And this isn't some slapdash one round boss fight. It has its own nice looking CG cutscene where JJ appears, but he happens to have one of the worst attempts at his voice I've ever heard. It's right out my window. I could write the copy myself. Now get me photos. That was the best take you got! Spidey gets lured to the local zoo, gets poisoned, has to navigate a series of traps while avoiding Kraven who's indulging in a bit of sniper elite, before climaxing with a little mono a spider. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? The whole chapter is over in about 15 minutes, but it's pretty elaborate and fun to play, making this, to me, the definitive version. The PS2, GameCube, and PC ones are all pretty much identical, so let's just hop on over to the GBA instead. It's quite different in that the plot is about as far away from the movie as it could be while still retaining the movie license. Spider-Man seems like he's been Spider-Man for a little while right when the game starts up and skips any of his origin stuff altogether. He's just out for a regular Monday patrol and just gets attacked by a conveyor belt of villains, including Shocker, Shocker! no, no, th okay, no, Vulture, Scorpion, all the usual suspects. Then, in less than two hours, you punch out the elf, and that's the end. Although, I absolutely have to give shoutouts for the lovely sprite work and the mind-melting 3D swinging sections, which are somehow more impressive than the most bleeding-edge tech that Sony can afford. Hell, even Grunkle Derek was impressed with these bits. Oh yeah, baby. That's the good stuff. Also, mwah, big chef's kiss to cramming in a clip from the film that's so grainy you think you're suffering from glaucoma. Oof, that's peak 2002 GBA hot girl shit right there. Also, just to clarify, this version was developed by Digital Eclipse and not Treyarch, and they should absolutely be proud of this charming little side-scroller. And with that, webheads, I do believe we've come to the end of another radioactive, I mean genetically modified adventure. I was pretty pleased to see that a game I had distinct memories of playing through some 20 years ago is still a good bit of fun, and it's interesting to see how much future foundation was laid out here. Although, it is a bittersweet reminder of the state of modern Treyarch today, which what was once an innovative, passionate studio is now just another soot stained face in the Call of Duty mines. Oh, that was a bit more depressing than I had originally intended. Uh, hey, I heartily award Spider-Man 2002 a 3.9 something of a scientist myself out of 5. I took off 0 .01 points for the uh, bomb mission. Do let me know in the comments below or swing your way over onto my Twitter to suggest any other spider-based gaming you'd like me to take a look at. And until then, Excelsior True Believers, and I'll see you next time on the Mediocre Spider-Mat. Yeah.